for Julie and I and, and our staff. We are so thankful for a church that, you know, we don't have to beg you to give. You, you, this is a giving church, and we, we are very thankful for that. Um, we don't beg you to make the payments or keep the lights on or anything like that. that let me just tell you how, how re releasing that is. But you, you have chosen to, to come through a series entitled The Seven Pillars of, 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 in Christ, of a successful Christian. And these seven pillars, we outlined and we started with Jesus Christ, the center pole of, of, the, of the tent. Without him, everything else caves in. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ, <coughs> you need to know Jesus. You need to know him as your Lord and Savior. Give him your life and, and, and live for him. You know, the next one we talked about was prayer. There, there's a definite intimacy when you can talk with God. When you can come to Him in, in trouble, but also in times of, of work, just relationship. Relationship with me is, is everything. I appreciate my relationship with God. Listen, church, relationships with man, with, with you know, a spouse, someone in your life may end. But God's relationship with you, he intends for it never to end. Isn't that good to know? We talked about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell with us, but not only with us, and in us. Once Jesus gave his life on the cross at Calvary, he dwells inside of us. And this is an important issue for us today, because without the Holy Spirit, you cannot be saved, and you will not remain saved without the Holy Spirit. Invite him into your life. Invite him into your heart. Invite him to every aspect of your, of your life. And we talked about love, and without God's love, we know that, well, first of all, God is love, and without His love being shed abroad in our hearts and poured into our lives, you know, life is going to be really tough because we'll see it through an unloving set of glasses. We need to see life through, through God's love and through God's willingness to, to, to love us in every situation and in all circumstances. And then last week we talked about marriage, and one person wrote me this week and said, uh, in an email, and it said, Pastor, last week's message was really tough, but I needed it. Thank you. I was like, well, that's right to the point and right to the point. But, you know, I, you hang around me very often, and I'm kind of just right to the point. Because I don't have time, you don't have time in life to what, um, I guess we would just say, jack around your whole life, you know, with detours. Let's serve God. And let's serve Him with all of our hearts. Amen? And let's not play games. We, I, I, you know, I, I'm here, I, you're a busy person, I'm a busy person. Let, let's not play games with God. Let's, let's get right down with what God would have for us. Amen? Can we do that? Every message is, is embellished with love. And so today then, or yet last week we talked about marriage and how important marriages are. Any community, any nation is only as strong as the marriages of that nation and of that community. So today we move over into the second area that I call you know, kind of the family matters of this successful Christian, because number one, marriages usually fail. First of all, when they don't have Christ in them, they're, they're, they've struggled for years. And then almost every marriage will fail if the finances are not talked about and kept under God's perfect plan. It, it just happens. Marriages are the greatest area of attack probably in a marriage is either sex, the, the issue of sex, or the issue of finances. And then next week we'll finish up this series and talk about discipleship. So would you stand with me and take your Bible? Hopefully you brought your sword and turn to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. This morning we said goodbye to a couple in the church that's moving to uh, Arizona, Roger and uh, Jan Marshall. We love them very much. They're very faithful to our church, have been for years. And um, so make sure that, I think they're already gone, but make sure that if you haven't seen them, say goodbye to them. Give them a call or, or stop by their house, they, their house sold. And we asked the Lord to hold the sale off as long as possible, but Roger was overwhelming with his prayer, so <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're moving to Arizona. Bless their hearts. In Proverbs chapter 3, we're talking about here today the first fruits, and we're talking about what finances under a godly program look like. Finances under a godly program. What do they look like? So here we go. In Proverbs 3, verses 8, uh, excuse me, verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions. That's everything you own. Everything. Lock, stock, and barrel. Honor God. If God needs to use it, if you need to let somebody 
borrow something or you need to go, if you don't want them to borrow, if you don't trust them to borrow, then go help them do something. Uh, or if you can't let them borrow something, then help them get something on their own or maybe get the job done in some way. He's just saying, in all your possessions, honor God. And usually that means helping people. I, I don't know, it just does. Usually it, when we talk about finances, it's all in order to reach more people for Christ. It's not about padding the pockets of the minister. Amen? That's not the deal. So here we go. Honor the Lord with your possessions, not your leftovers. Everybody say, not your leftovers. Not your leftovers. Not your leftovers. Here we go. And then he says, and with the first fruits of all your increase, so that your barns will be filled with plenty, using farmer's terms, and your vats will overflow with new wine, using uh, winery terms. So he is saying, honor God with your first fruits, the, the first portion of your income. Now that assumes and realizes that you realize that from there on, because you may not know what the remainder of your household bills will be for the rest of the month exactly, you probably know pretty well. It takes a certain amount of faith to say up front, I'm giving to God first, the first fruits of all my increase, the first fruits. First fruits says, I don't know how I'm going to make it through, but I'm going to make it because I trust God. Now, again, we're, we're talking about seven pillars of a successful Christian, and the area today is finances. Just like last week and the previous four weeks, we talked about how to be successful and to put that pillar underneath underneath us. So today I'm going to make a lot of references. I'll try to bring your mind back to being the reason we're talking about finances is because this is the week for finances. We don't talk about finances 52 weeks out of the year, but we do need to talk about them. And I promise you, we need to talk about them more. I've probably been a little delinquent in that area. And so we'll talk about them more. Everybody goes, Amen. But we're going to talk about finances today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment, this time. Help us to be responsible for all the areas that you call us to be responsible for. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. You know, sometimes I get a little bit too much to the point, so if I tell a joke, it's because it got too serious. Everybody knows, those of you who have been around very long, you know that I tell a joke. All right? Once in a while. You guys want me to tell you a joke? Are you sure? Okay, President, a pastor was riding through his community on his bike, and and he's riding around, and, and he's thinking about what he needs most in his life. And so he stops, and he just happens to stop and pull over by a paper. And then a little boy comes up pushing his lawnmower. He's got a, kind of a lawnmower business. And the boy's thinking, man, I'd sure like to have a bike. And the guy says, you know, he says, the church needs mowed. And, and he says, my yard needs mowed. He says, would you be willing to sell your, or to, to come and mow the lawn? He says, no, but I'd be willing to trade you my mower for your bike. So the pastor says, well... Okay, that's a good trade. I could, I could go back and get a bike some other day. So he takes the mower and he goes, goes back to the church and he's pulling on that thing and it won't start. He's pulling and he's pulling. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And he's pulling and, and it's hot. It's 90 degrees and he's pulling and he's pulling and he's pulling. And pretty soon he sees this bike riding by and he's just this kid on his bike and he's waving at him. Hi, Pastor. And the guy pulls over, the kid pulls over, he says, Pastor, how's the, how's the mower and mowing going? He says, well, I can't get this, this stupid thing started. He goes, what's wrong with this mower? Why won't it start? He says, well, it gets to a certain point and then it starts. He says, but this mower requires, you have to curse at it in order to get it to start. <laughs> and so the, the pastor says, well, I don't really curse. He says, well... Just keep pulling on that string, and it'll all come back. <laughs> and everybody said, Amen. Amen. All right, can we move forward from there? All right. So there's a lot to talk about in finances, and in the time remaining, in the next 25 or 30 minutes, I, I could not possibly tell you everything that God wants you to know. But I will tell you this. Remember that everything that God says for us to do it is not so that we will fail. It is so that we will succeed. Last week, remember what, what Joshua told us in his book? He said that if we meditate on the word of God, on the left and on the right, every day and every night, everything you put your hand to, you'll succeed. If you obey, it says, if in, in, my, in your day, if you will obey in the day that you've received it, you'll, success, you'll have success and you'll prosper. Now, 
I think what we have to define is prosperity. Prosperity to some people is having the next meal and barely getting by. Last night, Julie and I went to King Supers to buy for a lady that we love very much in our church. And, and she's recovering tremendously well, star ward from, from surgery. And she's doing well. And her son is committed to breast cancer surgery, way committed, very well. <laughs> yes, we love that, buddy. But we saw a man picking up old stogie, little stogie cigarettes because he couldn't afford to buy cigarettes, probably. And he, he was embarrassed of it, and he looked, and then he moved away from us, and then he waited, and you could tell he was looking at us out of the corner of his eye, and Julie says, like, what, what's he doing? And, and he was watching us, and, and then when we weren't looking, he thought we weren't looking, I saw him really quick pick one up. It must have been a little bit longer one or something. I don't know. But he didn't want anybody else to get it. You so you see, prosperity to him may think may be the next meal. Prosperity to you and I may say, well, could we afford another car? Or could we buy a motorcycle? Could we, could we get this or that? That's what prosperity may mean to us. But I want to define prosperity as having more than enough. Amen? Having more than enough. Your God is a God of way more than enough. But he always blesses us with the abilities where we're at. He wants to help you start where you're at and move to compliance with what God's word would be for us. So today, in the time that I knew I would have today, based on everything that's involved today, we have three areas that I think I want to bring to your attention and answer those questions. Number one, does God want my finances to be blessed? Does he want me to have, or, or does, am I always going to be kind of in a difficult spot, always, you know, kind of moving things around, robbing Peter to pay Paul and, and not paying this bill so I can pay that bill and barely getting by, or does God want me to prosper in my finances that I can have enough to help other people and, and still have all my bills paid because there's nothing worse than having bills that are unpaid and you wonder how in the world am I going to make this and let me know what I'm talking about that's a horrible feeling number two am I obeying God in the area of finances so God can bless them in other words am I sitting in a position with God have I moved my household finances over to that place with God that he says yes now I can bless them or are, is the money that I'm using and I'm spending is it things that he would say well you're spending it on other things first, and I'm getting the leftovers. Remember we talked about the leftovers when we read the scripture. Is God getting first of, all, of not only your time, your serving? Because, you know, some people come to me and say, Well, Pastor, I can't give my tithe financially, but I'll give my, my time to serve. And, and that's okay. That's a place to start. But that's not the tithe. The tithe is your increase, your finances, the increase of your wealth. So that your vats, because vats was, is a big round... Uh, oversized jar uh, that, that can't, two or three of them fit in a garage and, and they were huge and they, they were made to, to make wine in and they're saying your vats will overflow because you have so much new wine he talks about your barns being filled with plenty you have more than enough in, your, in that farmer term that grain, wheat, uh, animals that type of thing, that's what he was saying w would you be blessed in that area and wouldn't it be great to, I remember one year my dad, we, we were so blessed, he said to, to a, a needy family in the church, we're going to give you a half of a steer this year. We're going to butcher it for you. You just give this, the cutting specs, and we're going to give that to you this year. And, and that made me feel so good that our family we had arrived at that place where we thought we could give because we weren't very wealthy as a kid growing up. We, we, we had enough. We had more than enough, but we weren't like filthy rich. But it made me feel good to give to someone else. And the third question we'll ask answer is, um, what can I do to get God's blessing on my finances? In other words, I'm going to need to learn the standard. What is the standard that God expects? So God's desire is always that you succeed. That's always his desire. So whenever he gives a command, it makes it, you may say, oh, that was hard. But it's because he wants you to succeed. So position is everything. So as we talk about this, let's look at the first one by turning to the book of 3 John. So clear over to the right-hand side of your Bible, almost over to the book of Hey Jude, by the Beatles. No, it's not by the Beatles. Okay. Right next to Jude is the book of 3 John. Now this is the same John that wrote the, the Apostle, or the Gospel of John, and this is called an epistle. It says in verse 2, and he's writing... To us or through a, through a guy named Gaius and he says beloved I pray above all things that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers 
The requirement is that your soul prosper because if you don't know the information, you will perish. The Bible says in Habakkuk, because of the lack of knowledge, my people perish. So we have to have the knowledge of the word of God so that we won't perish. In other words, if we're not, if you have a pastor in your life that doesn't teach you the full uncompromised word of God, there'll probably be areas in your life that are delinquent because you don't know how to accomplish the, the greatness and the compliance of the word of God. And therefore you'll have areas where you're not complying and therefore you can't be under God's blessing. So that's why I like to say, let's, let's, let's read the whole thing. Okay, let's read on here. So the next verse says, for I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you just as you walk in the truth. Not only is the truth being explained to you, but then I love it when people go out and put the tire on the road, so to speak. They walk in that truth. They walk in what they were just taught. You walk in what you read from, the, from your, your weekly or your daily devotion. You, you begin to make application to your life, and God loves nothing more than to say, hey, can I, can I help you with that? As you're reading and, and as you're looking at something, Lonnie, real quick, stand up and, and, and hold your hand out like you're reading the Bible. Turn and face everybody, all these wonderful people. By the way, he's a Harley Davidson salesman with me, the bike like a good scene. And, and he's holding out the bike. <laughs> a little commercial there, sorry. <laughs> and, and so he's holding his word, and God just comes along and says, hey, let, let me help you with that. Let, let me help you put that on, on. And so therefore, the Holy Spirit comes and gets in, in our heart and begins to reveal what the word says to us. But let, let, the, let God come along and say, let, let me give you truth on that. Let me reveal what truth looks like to you on that. And that's what God wants to do. Thanks, buddy. And that's what, that's what God wants to do in our life is look over our shoulder as we're reading and as we're putting in the word. He wants to say, let me help you with that. Let, let me work this out with you and for you. So God wants us to prosper in all things. We see it here. But it has to be in truth. Did you get that? It has to be by walking in his truths, not in the lies of the world. The lies of the world will be temporary. In other words, it will be the way that the world says, go ahead and do it this way. Now, if you need something and you don't have the money for it, you know, you have to make the decision, do I go into debt for it? And there's good, there's good debt and there's bad debt. There's bad debt when you don't have the money to pay for it. Even if you liquidated everything, you couldn't pay off all your debt. That's really horrible debt. But bad debt says... I'm going to take this and go ahead and buy this when I know I don't have the money coming in. I'll work that out somehow later. That's bad debt. The good debt is when you buy like a truck and you put it to work in your fleet and you say, okay, we, we can pay this off in a year or less. That, that's good debt because it's working for you. It's doing something. It's producing something. It's helping you with something. That's, that's good debt. Hopefully, eventually... You are, you are working yourself where you say, okay, now I don't need to go in debt anymore because I kept that truck that was seemingly wore out at 100,000 miles. I'm going to keep it another year and we're going to go to 150, but we're going to take the payment that we would have made on a new one and we're going to put it away in an account so that hopefully we can maybe put a down payment. And then the next time it comes time to buy a vehicle, you say, well, not only do we do that, but we're going to put away some more and some more. Pretty soon you run your business debt free. Amen. And so God is looking at ways for us to be so blessed that we don't have to make bad decisions. Although, if you have to go in debt sometimes, make sure it's good debt. Amen. Not bad debt. There's a difference. And there's a, there's a really tight balance there. But he says, I want you to walk in truth. Verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Amen. So... It, it's clear here that I think God is inspiring John to tell us, and, and let me tell you this. In the 157 times that money is referred to in the New Testament and over a thousand times in the Old Testament, we are delinquent to put God's word to work in our lives in the area of finances because we kind of, it's, such a, it's such an area that people can get offended so quickly and so easily. And there have been misuses of it, abuses of it in the church. And I'll be the first one to stand up and say, that's wrong. If somebody is trying to get you to send them money on TV and they're going to send you a hanky, please hanky-panky up the phony bony. <laughs> okay? Would you please do that? Because it's probably as crazy as a Bill Clinton $3 bill. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's as phony as it can possibly be because the anointing, you know, in the, in the New Testament, yes, they, they would even lay handkerchiefs directly from Paul's side from his that he would pray over but you know that was called 
And so we have to be careful of, of gimmicks. We have to be careful of that. Your tithe belongs to the Lord where the, in the place where you are fed and where, where you are, are nourishing and helping others. You don't buy groceries at Albertsons or go pick them up at Albertsons and then walk across the street and pay it at, at, at King Supers. It wouldn't make no sense, right? So we're going to talk about how, how, does God want my finances blessed? Well, yes, he wants us to prosper in all things. Now in Luke 4.18, turn there with me quickly as we move down through some of these scriptures. And I hope that you'll write them down and take a look at them. Do not take my word for this message. Take it. Go write down the scriptures and go away and, and read it again and look it over. Jesus is in, is in the church of God on the Lord's day. He's there on the Lord's day, and he is saying, they've asked him to read something out of the book of Esaias, which is our book called Isaiah. And so he gets up and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. To the who? To the poor. Now, a lot of people will say, well, that's the poor in spirit. They're poor spiritually. Well, that's true. But listen, if they're poor spiritually, they're of the world, and they're coming out of the world into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. That means probably their finances were under that same mentality, which is a curse. And if their finances are in the world, they're under a curse because they cannot make it. The devil wants to only steal, kill, and destroy, and if he's the God of the world, and your money is in the world, your money will be under that th those three things. It will be stolen from you, it will be killing you, and it will be destroying you. Those three things. It may even be fashioned against you to kill you physically. And so we have to be careful about our money and keep every possession, everything we own, under God's authority. Now, look here on. It says, He has come to preach the gospel to the poor. That means poor financially, poor spiritually, poor mentally, and those poor in health. And then he goes on and says, He has healed, he has, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. A lot of times people make bad decisions. And it really doesn't break their heart. They're kind of like, ah, case or ah, whatever it will be, will be. But then after about three or four of those, they finally get to the point where their heart is broken. And they're like, I just keep making the same mistake. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? You make the same mistake. We're talking about finances. So I'm going to bring you back to, remember, this is the Sunday we're talking about finances. And so we make mistakes and we get broken hearted. And, and God doesn't want you to just keep going out and making the same mistakes. He doesn't want us to go out and keep getting broken hearted because it's with, where the heart when the heart is thinking and treasures the things of God, God can say, I know right where your heart is. Your heart is where your treasure is. Say that with me. Your heart is where your treasure is. And, by the way, your treasure is where your heart is. And so we have to look at those things that way. So he goes on and he says to proclaim liberty to the captives. Those that are captivated by debt. Those that are captivated by bad spending measures. Those that are captivated by frivolous spending or impulse spending. Those that are captivated by the things that the world has to offer and they can't get released from it because now they're entangled in the snare. And so he says, I came to preach to them to release them. And then he says, in recovery of sight to the blind. So open your eyes that you may see is what he is saying to us in this message today. Open our spiritual eyes, open our physical eyes that we can see and understand and get the things from the Lord so that we can see truthfully what he's saying to us today about finances. And then lastly, he says, uh, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Let me tell you something. There's nothing more painful than to say, man, I can't make my payment. I can't make my car payment. I'm oppressed. And, and it's not going to be any better next month. It's only going to get worse because we're already this far behind. And so now we're going we're gonna to try and get the groceries and all this and everything else. But boy, if, if, if I don't get some overtime or if we don't get this or we don't get that, or if you don't get a job, we're not going to make it. And that's a terrible feeling to feel. Amen. That's a terrible place to be. And so God is saying, you're, the devil comes to oppress you. And then usually it, it, it goes from suppression to oppression. Pretty soon the devil comes in and says, now I'm going to possess this situation. Suppression to oppression to suppression, and in there all along the way is depression. But let's put our finances underneath God, because then God says, I can bless that. So I believe, listen to this, for me to go on any further from here, I have to be able to get the spirit of poverty off of you. Because in the world, we will be defeated with the spirit of poverty. It came in when Adam and Eve partook of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Poverty immediately hit mankind. What happened? They had to go out and toil the earth. So that meant that by their efforts, they were either going to be wealthy or poor. 
by the trade that they did, they would either be wealthy or poor, by the choices that they make and the decisions that they do, they'll either be wealthy or poor or somewhere in between, middle class. So the, 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 the placard is, I believe it's hard to, to help people be blessed by God until I can get a spirit of poverty off of them. You need to know, first of all, that God wants you blessed. He wants you to prosper. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to have more than enough. In fact, we'll see today, if we have time, that he wants you to be able to give unto every good and perfect work. Every perfect, he wants to be, you to be able to give to that and it not affect you. From a standpoint of, it affects you like it did when I was a boy and watched my dad give away a half a beef. But, it, but that's a good effect. But it won't affect you from a standpoint of, well, then we won't be able to give. We won't be able to help. We won't be able to do anything else. We won't be able to live. We won't be able to eat. We won't even make our payments. That's what I mean by it won't, it won't affect you negatively like that. So we've come out, we have to come out of our old life, the old creation that we were saved from, and those old practices. Everybody say old practices. Oh. Come on, this is, this, is, this is gold being chiseled right out of a gold mine for you if you'll receive this from God. Because remember, I, your, your tithe doesn't come to me. It comes to Jesus. It comes to the Lord. My salary is paid. My Our board sets my salary. It's not like I'm getting paid because you get, well, I only get paid if you give. That's true in a, long, in a roundabout way. But, but I'm not sitting here like going, ho, ho, woo, just keep breaking it in. That's not what it's all about. I'm, I'm a salary paid pastor. Okay? So it's not like I'm reaping the harvest. I'm just wrecking everybody's life in order for me to fly in a jet and everything else. That's, that's just not it. We pay our bills around here. We take care of the community. I'm a shepherd. We, we want your best. We want you to succeed. Amen? Amen? And so we have to get those old practices off of us. We have to get out from underneath bad decisions involving every area of our life because he wants us to prosper in all areas. But we also have to get this area of finances talked about in the church. Now, let's see what God did in reality to set the standard. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 12, and let's look at the... the what we call the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. Say that with me. Abrahamic covenant. Genesis chapter 12. We know that from, from Genesis 1, the earth is created, the heavens and the earth, and all that stuff. And by the time you know Adam and Eve are there, and, and they get thrown out of the garden because they disobeyed God, and now God says, you know, it's time for a new covenant between man. It's not the full covenant of Jesus Christ because we're, we're still seven or 8,000 years away from that because God, we're slowly on our time clock. It's just a couple of days of his time clock because a thousand years is of a day with the Lord. Everybody understands that. So here in chapter 12, he says, there's some requirements if you want to live under covenant with God. There's some requirements. You know, I understand free love and I understand the freedom of all this and everything else, but God says, you know what? There's some conditions. I love you unconditionally. I take you as you are, but there's some things you've got to do in order to be blessed by who we call God. So here he says, the first thing you got to do is you got to get out of your country. That means you've got to get out of the mentality that you have with your finances now. It may not, if it's not blessed, then you move to that place or that land of where God says it's the land that flows with milk and honey. It's the promised land. I'm moving you, Abraham, there. Get out of your country. Why was that? Because his father, Taran, was supposed to move his whole entire household and family to the land of promise. And that's what God told Taran to do. Taran went to the, up to that, that, that line of scrimmage and didn't go any further. He went to the land of promise, the borders, and he stopped. And there he built a home and a household and everything else. And he established, and it was a good place to be. But it wasn't God's best. You'll find some good stuff in the world. You'll find some good things, some good training. But you will not find the best until you submit to God. Until you submit everything, possessions, lock, stock, and barrel, all your finances, and say, it all belongs to you. Because you're the creator of all this. You're letting me operate with 90% of it. And my 90%, now listen, this doesn't work in, in the world's realm, but 90% will be more of a blessing to you than 100%. That doesn't work. The numbers don't work. But I promise you, the 90% will be blessed because you give the 10%. I encourage people all the time, give 10% of your finances, of your business, of every single thing that comes into you, in, that you have control over, give 10% of it to the Lord. Now, let me, before anybody gets all upset and walks out the door, 
I'm the pastor that says, just as when you first get saved, you cannot be a fully complied, absolutely lock, lock stock, and barrel compliance Christian. There's some things you've got to grow through. There's some things of your past you've got to get rid of. And, and while God would take it from you like that, some of it is a process to get out from underneath it and get away from it. Would you agree with that? And so we process. I'm, I believe that I, I, I think more people succeed when they don't try to make it all in one move, but they process, and they learn, and they process, and they learn, and they take another step towards compliance, and they learn, because I think they'll succeed rather than doing it all at once and then failing. Are you following me? And I believe that that's biblical, because God tells us to take a step with him, draw near unto him. He didn't he would love for us to run into his bosom, but you know, sometimes that's a hard thing to do for people who really don't trust God as much as they should. And so I think God says, take this step and I'll be with you. Take that step and I'll be with you. He leans over our shoulder like I did with Lonnie. Let me help you with that. Let me work that out with you. So we see here, then he says, get from your country, get away from your family. You know what? Just because your dad was in debt and your grandpa was in debt and everybody maybe claimed bankruptcy doesn't mean you have to. Hello? Throw that off, get out from underneath that curse, and say, I'm going to be a godly man, I'm going to be a godly woman, I'm going to have, we're going to have a godly marriage, and you know what that means? We're bringing our finances and all of our earthly possessions with us, and we say, God, every single thing, every house, every home, every business, every dollar, every single tire, every single gallon of gas is all yours. And when you have that possession, that, that mindset of possessionship, God will say, there's a wise man. I can bless him with untold amounts of wealth because he won't say it's his. He'll say it's ours, wife included, God included. It's ours. And I tell you, we as a church are much stronger as a we. Julie and I are much stronger as a we than as a me. Amen? So get, this, is, this is pure gold, I'm telling you. This is pure gold. Chisel this out in your life. Put it to work in your life. Let's move on. He says, get out of your... Get, Away from your father's house. you got to get away. If your father was a drunk his whole life, don't be a drunk. Get away from that. Get away from that country. Get away from that household. Get away from that mentality. And, and get around people that have a, a circumference around them that say, hey, we ain't going to be drunkards. We're going to lead you in godliness. We're going to lead you to the deeper things of God. And I promise you, you begin to succeed to the level of the people you surround yourself with. Amen? following me? It's pure gold, I'm telling you. It'll help you. Throw off those people that don't want to go with God and play games with God. This is being real. Come on now. You might have to say bye to some friends. Moving on, it says, and I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. Make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. And I'll bless those who bless you. And I'll curse him who curses you. And he said, God would curse someone? Well, he doesn't have a lawnmower, so he's not going to curse, okay? But, <laughs> that's good. But, listen, God says two things. This day, he says, this day, choose whom you will serve. I can just see God. Because it's the picture I get when I change my ways. God says, this day I set before you blessing and cursing. Good and evil. Choose this day whom you'll serve. And he says, let me give you a hint. Choose me. Because if it's not under God's blessing, which requires a covenant and obedience, it will be under what God says, if I don't bless it, it's cursed. Because I don't touch it, I'm not on it, I'm not involved in it. By nature, I created either good or evil. In between, there's no such thing. Processing from where you were in a place of sin to a place with God is a such thing. I think you walk from it. It's a process. You learn from it. You learn from your mistakes. And you fortify it so you say, I'll never make that again. But the, the place where God is not is a place of curse. And so he says, it's cursed. I, I can't bless it because the world's going to have its daggers in it. We'll, we'll see that in just a minute. We look over in, verse, in chapter 13. In one chapter it says, verse 1, that Abram went from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, did you hear that? And all that he had. Everybody say, all that he had. All that he had. Come on, say it again. All, all that he had. He took all of his possessions. And, and it says in verse 2, And Abram was very rich 
in livestock, in silver, and in gold. In that day, the culture was this, and I researched it. If you left your father's house, if you stayed in your father's household, you inherited everything that was there, and you became the household name. And he was that person, that heir apparent. He left, and so he had to take with him Sarah, his wife, and any servants that his father might have given him, a few animals to eat along the way, and you got to make it on your own. Because you're leaving your household, you're leaving your father, and you're dissing him. So he had to go on his own and trust God that what he was doing was the right thing to do. Amen. And, and so this is very serious. He, he went and he had to make it on his own. And so when we see that in this verse 2 of chapter 13, he was already rich. Why? Because he was doing some things to put his everything that he owned under the authority and the blessing of God. Either blessed or cursed. Which will you have? I think I'll take blessed. Well, but I'm not ready to just go there all at once. I don't have that kind of faith. Good. Let's take a step. Draw near unto me and I'll draw near unto you. Take another step. Learn and, and move over and migrate to that place of blessing. Now, if you can make it in one fatal swoop, go for it, sweetheart. Do it. Trust in God all the way. But get there and God will bless you for that. Because it says then by verse 6, they were so blessed, him and Lot were so blessed that the land was not able to support them that they might dwell together for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together. In other words, him and Lot were so blessed by their practices that by the time they get near the border of the promised land, Abram says, and we're eating all the grass, everything's gone. You take the direction you want to go and I'll take the direction I want to go. Now Lot fell into sin. He says, oh, this looks really green and lush over here. I'll go this way. Abram said, well, it's awful dry over here, parched. There's only rocks. And as you know how Israel is, there's parts of it that are very, very rocky. If you, you get a little blade of grass, that's about all you're going to get. So he saw that and he says, I'll go this way. And God said, I got you back. I'll bless you. By the next chapter, we see that Abram was so blessed. He was so blessed. In fact, turn over to chapter 14, verse 18, that he's winning battles and in his nephew... Lot has gotten in trouble with the king of Sodom, and you know what happens in Sodom and Gomorrah, don't you? Anybody not know about Sodom and Gomorrah? The place of tremendous evil that, that's happening there, and God destroys it, but the king of Sodom has got his claws into him, and, and Abram has to go and, and, and steal him out. And as he did, he's destroying, and, he's, and, and so the king, a guy shows up on the scene by the name of King Melchizedek. Now, King Melchizedek, as it shows up in the book of Hebrews, he's a theophany of Christ, or he's a type of Christ that shows up so that we understand who Abram is paying his tithe to. Are you following me? He's, he's going to give his tithe to someone. It's, it's not Jesus in the flesh, but it's a type of Christ. And so we see here then that the king of Sodom has been defeated, and Abraham takes a stance for God. Let's take a look at it. Verse 18, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. When we see bread and wine anywhere in the Bible, what, what could we think of? Communion, right? So this king, Melchizedek, it says, of God most high, and that means El Elyon, or the most supreme, comes and brings out bread and wine from this priest of God. And that word priest there is used only this time in the Old Testament to be the priest that ascends. Did you get that? The priest that who's going to ascend someday, some 7,000 years later? Jesus Christ, who brought into us bread and wine at the communion table at the Last Supper. So that gives us an indication as to who this King Melchizedek is. So reading on, it says, and remember now, Abram has already defeated the king of Sodom to get his, his nephew out. And he blesses him, it says. Blessed be Abraham of God most high possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be God most high who has delivered our your enemies into your hand so in other words God rebuked the devourer say that with me God rebuked the devourer that will mean something to you in just a few minutes as we work our way through this I got a hustle here the next words and he Abram gave him Melchizedek a tithe of all so if you want your finances to be blessed, he's saying, he is showing us that Abraham gave a tithe. Now, is that the requirement? Well, we'll see here in just a little bit. Now, the king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, 
that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. As we stop there and, and think about that for a minute, what was just said to us? Abram says, even though the battle was mine, the victory is the Lord's. He is saying, I'm not going to take all these, this village from the land of Sodom. It's kind of dirty, contaminated money. And he's saying, I won't take it because God said I shouldn't take it. It belongs to him. This is the first victory before we go into the land of promise. And so he said, therefore, I'm, I'm raising my hand to God most high because God, if he wants me wealthy, he can make me wealthy. And he's saying, I'm not going to take it from this guy because I'm going to let him live. And if he goes away and I take all of his goods, he's going to say to the whole world, the world made Abram rich. If, if I believe in everything that I just said, that God is the, that everything that I own is God's, then God made me wealthy. Every, it's God's responsibility to take care of me and my wife and my children. It's God's responsibility because I've got, I'm doing everything I can for him. It's his deal to bless whatever I put my hand to. Before I, we moved here, I worked in, at Rocky Flats. Before that, I drove a, a Coke truck for, for Coca-Cola. Before that, I, uh, through all of that, built houses and kept everything in front of God and said, God, you bless it. And so for the first four or five years, before we could really pull a check from the church and take on our income from here, I built and sold houses. And I learned that trade from my father who learned it from his father and showed us how to farm and to trade and do all those things that we could do. And so you see, God will bless whatever you put in front of him. He'll bless it if you possibly, if you possibly can, if you don't bring it to him under the curse. And so Abram was saying, I can't take that to God. That's under the curse. That came from the world of the most ugliest stuff. I'm going to raise my hand to God and say, no, you'll not say that you made me well wealthy. God made me wealthy. And that's what he is saying. And that's what the tither says when he brings his check to the Lord or brings it to the church here and puts it in the coffers of the church. You're saying, God has made me wealthy, not my job. I thank you for my job. I thank you for my employment. But I thank you, Lord, that you are first on the list. You're the first fruits and not me. Amen. Keep it at first with God. Now we're looking at me like a cow at a new gate. All right, here we go. <laughs> Let's move on. Number two. These next two will be shorter. Do I obey God with my finances so he can bless me? Let's find out what the standard is. Turn with me to Malachi, the good old Malachi. You know, Malachi chapter 3. Now, a lot of people, let me give you an illustration. They, they go through the book and they say, okay, well, tithing was in the Old Testament, but it's not in the New Testament. As if by turning this page, God decides that everything I said before, forget it. For everything I just talked about on tithe, in fact, we see the last book of the Bible is the strongest on the, on the word tithe. Tithe means a tenth, bring a tithe. It's the last book of the Old Testament. And so here we are. Some people are like, I, almost, I made fun of it this morning in first service. It was like, woo, am I tithing? Not tithing. Blessed? Not blessed. Do I have to give? Woo, woo, back and forth. If God forgets it, we don't have to tithe. We just, woo, 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 just because one little page turned. Are you kidding me? Come on now. You just want me to see me dance some more, don't you? But let's read here and see what the standard is. Because Jesus said, or the Bible says in Hebrews, what? Chapter 13, verse 5. He said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I change not. Amen? Amen. Look what it says. I am the Lord. Guess what he's going to say? The first thing he says in verse 6. I do not, what? Change. I am the Lord. I do not change. And he says, therefore, you are not consumed. In other words, he doesn't change. He says, I want you to have long life. I want you to have great healing. I want you to have great finances. I want everything. In other words, God wants you to be blessed. He doesn't want the blessings to own you. He doesn't want the money to own you. He doesn't want the prosperity to run your life. So he says on, he says, Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances. You see, that's where we're at today in society. We've gone away from the ordinances of God, and then we wonder, why don't things work no more? You know, you know what I'm saying? Why don't they work? He says, And you have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, in what way have, shall we return to you? That's a good question. I think a lot of people ask that about finances in the church. And he answers that, that with another question. He says, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. And you say, in what way have we robbed you? And that's a good question, too, because a lot of, I, I don't know, how do you rob God? How do you take from God when it's all his anyway? 
then, then we must see that it's a spiritual issue, not a physical finance issue. Because if you're robbing God, God is spirit, and you must worship God in spirit and in truth, right? You can't take money out of God and think you robbed God. People that try and break up the church and bust things and take out trinkets out of the church, that, that don't rob God. God doesn't need that. He can replace that like that. Robs us of his ability to bless us. That's what it robs. It robs his, his ability to say, you're, you're, under, you're under the blessing, therefore I can bless you. If it's not coming before God and you're giving it to God, then it's got to be under what? The curse. See, all on this side, not under the curse. I'm just saying, this side over here. I'll move over here. It's right here. Amen. <laughs> Everybody says thank you. So he says, you're, you're robbing me. And, and he says, in what way we robbed you? And then he answers it. He says, in tithe and offering. For you have robbed me because I can't bless you. See, it's not about the money we got. It's about the heart. He wants to be able to bless you. And so if you're here today for the first time hearing about giving to God for the first time, let me tell you something. God wants to bless you in areas of finances. But he wants you to be responsible with that blessing. He wants you to make sure that you bring back 10% to him, to his church. Why? So the church can be strong. So we can, we can be a strong entity. My grandfather used to say, the strongest church in any community will be the church full of tithers. Because we'll reach our community, and you won't even bat an eye. Because we'll, we'll reach out with love to help the needy. We'll reach out with good counsel, with good marriage ceremonies, with good marriage counseling. All kinds of great things will be there because the church is strong. When the church is more focused on, oh, we can't pay our bills, and let's take a second offering. Oh, no, let's take a third offering today. It's only because we don't have tithers that we have to, we have to encourage people to give a little bit more. You see what I'm saying? I'm saying that to you on Vision Sunday, by the way. And I'm just going to be honest with you and open with you, very transparent. The reason a lot of churches have to take two offerings is because there's not tithers in the church. Did you get that? Because if everyone in this church tithes, we would have built the church out 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And we would not only have done that, but we would have reached the world in a stronger way. And if every church got this message today, every church would be paid for, every, every ounce of it, and pastors would be responsible not to build above beyond their congregation and take their congregation into a million dollars of debt. We would build a facility on this thing in three years if people would start tithing. We would build a facility cash, debt-free, paid for, lock, stock, and barrel. If people would just give of their tenth. Now, can we just bring that down to, to, to the other place? There used to be a group of boys that came from Harvest Farm Rehab Center. And they were rehabbing from being alcoholics, the troubles of life, all kinds of court issues. They got $10 a week stipend to buy their laundry detergent, personal bowls, and things like that while they're in this program. They got $10 a week from Harvest Farm. They would come here and they would say, Pastor, I feel so embarrassed. It's like, I just want to give the whole $10. I'd like to give more than that. Because usually, really poor people have more of a giving heart sometimes than really wealthy people. Unless they're saved, unless they're born again, unless they're changed in their heart. Then they become hilarious givers. And that's why I love this. <coughs> These guys come in and they say, Pastor, what am I giving a dollar? That's not going to affect anything, Pastor. I said, No. It won't affect anything if you say it won't affect anything. But if you bring it and you say, Lord, this is my tenth. I'm going to give my tenth. And you put it in the offering plate. You give it with a cheerful heart. That will, that will break God's heart. And he will pour out abundantly. And that dollar will have some sort of spending ability like you've never seen a dollar go. A dollar. And I'm telling you, when those guys gave, they were so blessed. I mean, every Monday night, they'd come pour into my house to watch Monday night football. And we have all these guys in there that, I mean, we just come from every aspect of the world, all every kind of culture, background, skin color. And we have like 20 or 30 men standing in our front room. They were just so blessed. They're like, Pastor, we're getting jobs. And we're getting out pretty soon. And, and because we're tithing, God's blessing us. And we're getting jobs. And we're able to pay cash for a car. And we go out and we help them find that car that they can pay cash for. You see, that's the kind of thing that gets... It's my getter. I, I want to see people blessed so that they can bless someone else. And that's what God loves to do. He loves to bless you so you'll bless someone else. But money is like manure. What? <laughs> it is. If you hoard it and pile it up 
It stinks. But if you spread it out, it grows all kinds of wonderful stuff. Amen. So Malachi says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. It's an armory. It's an establishment. And he says, and try me now in this. You can try him. It's the only place in the Bible you can say, Lord, I don't know if I'm going to make it to the end of the month, but I'm going to try. I'm sure going to try you, Lord. I'm going to test. And you, and you say, Lord, help me. Now, if you give it and you say, but I don't think it's going to work. And all, week, all month long, you're like, it ain't going to work. I'm really fretting. But if you give it, uh, not of necessity and not begrudgingly, but you give it and you say, Lord, and, and really, it's okay. This is, I'm the pastor that says it's okay to start where you can and move to where you can. If you start where you can, that means you're saying, okay, I'm good with this. And it gets some a level of confidence going. I'm going to start here, but where we need to be, honey, is over here. And so I'm going to start here. And next week, God may say, okay, that was good. That's what you could do. Now let me show you what you can't do. And, and then, then you say, okay. And, and you say, okay. And you say, okay. And then God, it gets really tough. And then all of a sudden, the, the boss comes up to you at work and says, you know what, man? You've been working so hard. It seems like you're focused on some things. And, man, the job is going great. We're going to give you a bonus or a raise or something along those lines. And, and the raise comes and it's more than you expected. And then what most people do then is they go out and they buy a new truck. Good for you. Hello, come on. God bless you with that so that you could become a giver. Not so that you could have more debt. That's what he blessed you for. Because he wants you to live debt free. He wants to move you to a place of debt free living. Where you're not paying Peter to pay Paul to all these other guys. And oh my God, what are we going to do? He wants you to live debt free. Not paycheck to paycheck. And that, that's, that's pure gold. I'm telling you, chisel it out. It's pure gold. But the only way you get there is to start. And if you start with a little, then God will let you be responsible over a little. And if you'll move on to more, then God will make you <coughs> responsible over more. And that's therefore the responsible become responsible for things great. Like huge ministries. Like other things. There's world outreach centers. Where we can reach the world, because, but the guy inside is still close to God and still is simple and humble. That's why I surround myself with men and women that know how to be humble, but yet have wealth. They know how to handle them. They know how to have, have them. Not the perfect person, but the person that made mistakes and can speak into my life and has come through it and says, Rick, you can make it. Amen. Let's move on quickly. What can I do to get God's blessing on my finances? The answer is start. Start. Start somewhere. Stop living like you're... If your dad was broke, start. stop living like you're a broke son of the dad that was broke. Stop it. Because your heavenly father is not broke. Amen? He owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns all the gold and all the silver. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I could sit down with every single one of you that say, Pastor, we can't afford to tithe. And I'll tell you, in 15 minutes, you can. What? I'm not a financial investor, a financial planner. But I am no dummy. Because I have come through the school of hard knocks, and I have the certificate and the bruises to prove it. Hello? It's called experience. I don't need to know the numbers, what your numbers are. I don't need to know how much you make and how much your house payment is. I don't need to know how much your car payment is. I can tell you, because you're human, that there's some areas that you can get better in. What can I do to get my finances? Start tithing, but turn with me first to your left, about two books, to the book of Haggai, as we begin to close this message. Are you still here? To the book of Haggai. Just back when slang was in the Bible. Hey, guy, what's <coughs> going tonight, man? Hey, guy. <laughs> that was a bad joke. Come on now. I made the second row laugh, you know. His name was Haggai. Hey he was a minor prophet of God. It says in verse 5, Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts. Now, let's stop right there. The same God that said to Abram in Genesis 12, I'm going to make a covenant with you, is talking to Haggai right now. And he says, Haggai, you're my prophet. We're about to end this thing called the Old Testament, and Jesus, my son, is about to come on the face of the earth. In a 
this short hundred years, Jesus is going to come and he's going to be that King Melchizedek that wants to face the earth, that Abram's high to. As you walk through the Bible, you see all along the way that wealthy men and families gave to God. And the poor ones, we don't read about them. Because they could. Listen, when I say poor, let, let me qualify that. Poor in the world standards. But let me tell you something. When we first started this church, we didn't have a lot of money. We had fun with no money. We made it work with no money. She cut out coupons. We saved and scrimped. But we made sure God was first. Thursday night was WrestleMania night in my house. Sam against Crystal. Ricky against Candace. And mom and dad were the referees. We pushed the furniture away. We couldn't afford to take the kids to a movie. Are you kidding me? I make $7 an hour as a farmer. I worked for Art Meyer up north. Seven bucks an hour. I was in the tractor every moment I could possibly be in there. Seven bucks an hour. I went from 39 bucks an hour at Rocky Flats to seven bucks an hour for Art Meyer. But you know what? My money was blessed. It wasn't under a curse because I've been taught by my father who caught the, caught the spirit of, of prosperity late in, in life but begin to show me that the stuff I spent my money on was stupid, turn around, bend over, keep giving a dollar to the church and drinking $30 during the week. Are you kidding me? They don't call that Bud Wiser. They call that Doug Bud Dumber. <laughs> Amen. Spend more on the things. If, if you're spending things on the world and bring a dollar to church, that's not a heart for God. Come on. I'm saying this in love. I'm saying this to you. If even if it's the first time you're hearing this, I'm saying it. How can God bless that when all of your focus is on the world? And you come to church in that area of finances, you say, my God, keep your hands off. So you need to change that mentality to everything I own, everything I have is God's. I'll tell you from whether seven bucks an hour or 39 bucks an hour, blessing better than cursing. And I didn't always get the curse of blessing. Because I made bad mistakes and I made bad investments. But I had to go back and say, God, forgive me for that. That was really boneheaded, stupid of me. It took my family and almost financially ruined us. And God says, just stay with me. Keep my hand. And we did. Well, not only overcame it, but I'm so thankful that I just trust in God. So when I, let me say it again, you don't bring your tithe to me. You bring your tithe to Jesus. You, when you put it in the offering plate, you say, Lord, this is yours. This, this is not pastors. This, this is not my, my wife's. This is not my children. Because if I give it and leave it for an inheritance to them, it'll be like wasted manna. It's going to have worms in it. It's going to turn to nothing. I'm giving it to you first, so the rest of the 90% is blessed. Because I want it to be blessed under the blessing and not under the cursing. Look what he says. The next three words in this is, consider your ways. Consider your ways. And he says, you've sown much. This sounds like a lot of us today. You've sown much and bring in little. You eat but do not have enough. That tells me there's something that's not being satisfied there. I've got a full belly. I went to Country Barfay, you know, and I'm just, I'm full. Had a $30 bill. We paid it, man. I feel good. There's something that's not quite satisfied from here to here. You know what I'm talking about? Come on, that, that, that's why for years, for like some 14 years, I drove the same pickup. Had over 400,000 miles on it. Couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't repair the injectors anymore. I mean, it, it, it was just time. So I buy a different truck. I'll have it for a long time. But my job today is to help you say, don't, don't be invested in things invested in God. And the things will be okay if your heart's with God. It may take a while, may get some hurt, but if you just get started in this, there, there may be some difficulty ahead, but God will be with you through it all, but you have to trust Him all the way through it. Because the first fruit says, I assume, you realize there may not be anything at the end for a while. Start where you can and move where you can. Consider your ways. Listen to this. 
you drink and you're not filled, you clothe, but you're not really warm. You earn wages, and you earn wages to put into a bag with holes. That is a perfect example as I close and, and, and begin to close down your mind on this. Think of a burlap sack bag that you can hold about so big. And every time you get a paycheck, you take it, and it, let's just say it converts to sand, and you take it and you put the sand in your bag. The first thing you should say is, Lord, I'm taking out 10% of that and taking it to the church and putting it in the offering plate. Now, as a society, I understand. You, you may not get there. You can't get there. You, you say, whoa, Uncle Sam wants 30% or 40%. I'll pay that. And I don't want to go to jail. God's pretty cheap, man. He says, you get off cheap with God, you only get 10%. But he says, I'll bless the rest of it if you'll give me that 10. But what we do is we say, no, I'm not going to. So therefore, we drink and we're not full. We eat and we're not filled. We're clothed, but we're not warm. Why? Because we're under the curse and not under the blessing. We did a whole lot more our first year making $9,000. We were happy. People helped us and blessed us. We raised our children and we never missed a meal. We never missed anything. We were more blessed with that little easy beasy bit amount. That's poverty. Poverty. But God wanted to move us and let us see that He could be our provider. And we've never gone without. We've never been without. And I, I tell you that not to break my arm or pat myself on the back, but to tell you that God was in it every step of the way. We wouldn't have made it without God. Did you get that part of it, please? Please hear that more than anything else. That God did the work and we did we did what we were supposed to do. So when you consider your ways, he says you're putting wages into a bag with holes. What happens when it's under the curse, not you guys, but this side, the devil says, well, God can't protect it. He's not going to rebuke the devourer, so I have free right to take a dagger and poke a hole in it. Oh, let's, let's deal with some wayward children. Out it starts to come. Let's deal with some health issues. And it starts to like a time clock that it just keeps draining out and that hole it's like a, a bag with holes in it and every time you, you say well Lord we'd love to give but we really need to buy a new truck and every time you turn around the devil has that little dagger and he's poking it might not be a lot but it's draining and so you all of a sudden recognize at the end of this month we're not going to make it honey you better go get another job so the man runs out and gets another job so now he's putting in two handfuls every week. And the devil goes, yeah, now the dad's out of the house. He's working on Saturdays and Sundays. He can't go to church. He can't leave his family. His wife's not going to church because she's too tired after raising all the kids. So therefore, the family will be defeated because without the knowledge, they will perish. Ha <laughs> I got him. Now, all of a sudden, that's not enough because mom says, no, regardless of what happens, I'm going to take my children to church. So he says, okay, another dagger or two ought to fix that and mom had, now has to go to work. 1971 was the changing point where mom said we got to go to work because the world is too expensive and so mom's left the kids at home to go home on, to an empty house. The empty house dwellers we called ourselves got off the bus and went home to an empty home. Amen. Are you following me? That was the devil at work all along poking a hole into a bag that has holes in it just draining the sand out. And so now mom is here, and dad is here, and pretty soon if we don't watch it, mom is doing two again, because now she's got two jobs, and he's got two jobs. What are the kids doing? Well, they're playing sports on Sunday morning, because that's what we want to go do. We don't want to be taught of the Lord. We don't want to be good. And so now the whole deal is the family's being destroyed, which the devil earnestly, dead, dreadfully wants the family destroyed. Keep it under the curse. No. Come on now. I'm about to tell the joke because it's getting too serious. He wants us to move it under the blessing. And he says, Here, here's a brand new burlap sack. Here's a brand new one. You gave your life to the Lord. Start over. Oh, you made a mistake? Start over. Here, here's a new bag. Go ahead and start over. You're a brother in Christ. You're a sister in Christ. Here's a new bag. Get started. Try again. We forgive you. God forgives you. You're forgiven. Start anew. But when you start new, that means you start new everything new. Amen? So you, now you have that new bag and you say, Lord, what I do have, I'm going to put it under you. And you look, that's what's coming out the bottom. We got more money. Let me say this. 
when I said I could find money in your house, probably there's impulse buying that doesn't need to happen. Probably there's frivolous spending that we could point out. Let me just put it to you this way. If you spend more on personable items that you say I could do without that. Last night we were buying for someone very special in our heart. And we were at King Supers and I said, I just want to see what other things cost. Things that people could do without. without. Are you kidding me? Coke is expensive. <coughs> Bud Dumber is even more expensive. For a 12 pack, are you kidding me? It's like 14 bucks. You do that. The Marlboro man is gouging your your finances <coughs> like you would not at like eight dollars a pack? You kidding me? You take that stuff and get rid of that stuff and get rid of the, 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 the things you can do without. You quit bringing a dollar to God and you'll start saying, Lord, I, I can bring you 20 bucks. I can bring you 40 bucks because I quit smoking, because I quit drinking, because I quit hanging out with people that are, have a poverty mentality. I'm going to start hanging around with Pastor Rick. Or I'm going to hang out with Robert. I'm going to hang out with some of these guys that, that know, that, that, that live for God. And I'm going to start hanging out with Pastor Julie. I'm going to start hanging out with Gil and Mindy. I'm going to start hanging out with some of these people. I'm going to be back there hanging with Phil. He's, he's walking through some stuff, but I'm going to walk through it with him. I'm going to walk through it with these people because I'm going to surround myself with people that know how to, how to stay true to God. And those people that are on the outside going, yeah, but you're always going to be Rick Carlson. You'll always be that guy. No, I don't even know who you're talking about. I have known that guy for years. That's in my past. That's in my past. Amen? Thank God. That's why we cover it up. Because we don't want nobody to see our past. You still love me? Consider your ways. Greatest enemy, you might say, is debt. Probably not. Because there's good debt and there's bad. You know what's probably your worst problem? Bent spending. Problem. What do you do without that stuff? And instead, put that money in a jar and say, I'm saying thanks to the Lord. I'm going to start my tithe program. I'm going to start my tithe program this week. I'm going to bring that to the Lord. And I'm not going to mark down the aisle and, because God wants you to give quietly. He wants you to give with no, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. And if you really mean that, just do quietly in the offering plate. And if you really, 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 really just don't want anybody to know, then just put it in the, the box that's attached to the wall right in the, outside the door. It's a little quiet box to give to because we want people to feel comfortable with that. Also because sometimes on Monday, somebody will come back to the church and say, I should have given my tithe. I was going to withhold it and I want to give it. They'll just walk in and put it right there. That's between them and God. I don't even know it. I don't even come out of my office. But sometimes people want to give quiet. You see, when you start getting this area taken care of, I promise you it will bleed over into marriage. That's pure gold. You, you guys that are married, you know what I'm talking about. And, and, and if you get your marriage, marriage taken care of, it will bleed over into your finances. All of these bleed over into your prayer life, the Holy Spirit, and love. But I promise you also, the one that gets taken down quickest is the discipleship. We can't afford to go overseas. We can't afford it. Stand with me if you would. <clears throat> Don't you appreciate old hey guy a lot more now? Consider your ways. Lastly, this last slide says it all. It says everything. Decisions determine direction. It's pure gold, I'm telling you. Not because I thought of it, but because it's biblical. Your decisions determine direction, and your direction will determine where you will arrive, your destiny. What direction you take from here today, right here, determines whether you put your finances under blessing, because that's what we're talking about. Are you going to be blessed? Consider your ways. Or will you leave them under the curse and just go ahead and Go ahead and work that third job. Go ahead and work every Sunday. Work your finger to the bone and tell me how that works out for you. Or maybe wouldn't it be better, more productive to put it under God's blessing and say, you know what? I'm going to go to Nicaragua. I'm going to go to Guatemala. I'm going to go to Mexico. I'm going to be a blessing to the Mexican people. I'm going to go to Guatemala and be a blessing to them. I'm going to go to India with Pastor in a year. And we're going to be a blessing to the Indians over there and teach them about Jesus. Come with me. 
to a village where they've never heard the name of Jesus before. Come with me and I'll tell you about someone who we would say is impoverished and you think he owns the world because you just told him about Jesus. That, that, that will change your life forever. My son Sam has changed forever. My son-in-law Ken changed forever. Wrecked, wrecked for the world. We wrecked him. He's no longer good to the world. He's wrecked. Candace wrecked him first. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so if you want your life wrecked so it can't be used again, if you're living in the old world, let Jesus wreck your car for you. Let him wreck your house. Let him wreck that whole life because then you won't go back to that vomit. You'll say, start saying, Lord, I want to serve for you. And he has a way of getting every spot and every wrinkle out of your life. Amen? I will only raise my hand. Say that with me. I will only raise my hand to the Lord Most High. Come on, say it out loud. To the Lord Most High. And if that's you today, then begin today to start saying right now, Next Sunday, I'm bringing my tithe, the portion that I know I can. And if you say, no, I'm not going to just do what I can. I'm going to do what I can. I'm going to trust God. And that's up to you. And God. But I'm not telling you to. I'm telling you to start where you can and move where you can with God's help. Amen? And you know what we'll see? We'll start to see people so blessed. I'll start hearing about somebody who blessed somebody else. And they bless somebody. And we'll start hearing about the stuff. Well, and you watch. Blessings will start flying around this church. And we'll start seeing people bless. We'll start hearing about the community. And you might say, well, I don't know if I want to give to the Boys and Girls Club. You know what? If River of Life up your right to all of that, don't you think we're going to have an influence there? Huh? And if we if we start doing programs through the AMP, and all the kids start coming to the AMP, even more, I mean, they almost all do now, but even more, don't you think we're going to have something to say about, who, about Jesus and all of that? Don't you think we're going to be able to have influence in that? I truly believe what my grandfather said, and I promise I'll shut up after this, is that the, the most influential church in any community will be full of tithers. Now, it's Vision Sunday. I didn't plan it this way, but it worked out in both services. We should be receiving, have received a vision offering for the AMP today, second offering. But I'm going to leave it up to you. If you have something you want to give to the AMP, the ushers are at the door. They'll receive it. And you know what? If you don't, if you say, I'm not in a place yet, my faith isn't there, there is no condemnation, not even in the slightest bit. Not one bit. But I promise you, if you'll trust God in the areas of your finances this week, you'll get a heart for those kids that don't have a church over there at the end. Kids that maybe don't have parents that enforce an environment of godliness in their home, like your kids get, they don't get that. They get told they're stupid. They get told all kinds of things. They don't get told anything by their mom and dad. Alcohol, drugs are available to them at the age of seventh grade and sixth grade and eighth grade. Are you kidding me? Marijuana has been approved. So now we have kids smoking marijuana in sixth grade. Come on, man. You can't be of the state and approve marijuana in a state and then wonder, why do our sixth graders smoke dope? Are you hearing me today? So we're going to change that. And we can only do it with your help. Love you all. That's my message for today on finance. I hope you'll find a way to put everything under God and trust Him. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we just pray over our finances today. Lord, we could have made this message, the life message, but Father, you just said to make it a pillar. So Father, we just pray in Jesus' name that you would touch each and every heart, touch each and every thought and mentality. And Lord, may we arrange ourselves back here, position ourselves next week to learn about discipleship and how we can take the word of God to the world. And it begins with our neighbor right next door. Help us, Lord, think about that and ponder on it. Tie ourselves, Lord, into a mentality of that, Lord, we're, we're connected to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great day.